It has set at last, said Nina to her mother, pointing towards the hills behind which the sun had sunk. Listen, mother, I am going now to Belongi's Creek, and if I should never return, she interrupted herself, and something like doubt dimmed for a moment the fire of suppressed exaltation that had glowed in her eyes and had illuminated the serene impassiveness of her features with a ray of eager life during all that long day of excitement, the day of joy and anxiety, of hope and terror, of vague grief and indistinct delight. While the sun shone with that dazzling light in which her love was born and grew till it possessed her whole being, she was kept firm in her unwavering resolve by the mysterious whisperings of desire which filled her heart with impatient longing for the darkness that would mean the end of danger and strife, the beginning of happiness, the fulfilling of love, the completeness of life. It had set at last. The short tropical twilight went out before she could draw the long breath of relief. And now the sudden darkness seemed to be full of menacing voices, calling upon her to rush headlong into the unknown, to be true to her own impulses, to give herself up to the passion she had evoked and shared. He was waiting. In the solitude of the secluded clearing, in the vast silence of the forest, he was waiting alone, a fugitive in fear of his life. Indifferent to his danger, he was waiting for her. It was for her only that he had come, and now, as the time approached, when he should have his reward, she asked herself with dismay what meant that chilling doubt of her own will and of her own desire. What, with an effort, she shook off the fear of the passing weakness. He should have his reward. Her woman's love and her woman's honor overcame the faltering distrust of that unknown future waiting for her in the darkness of the river. Now you will return, muttered Mrs. Almayer prophetically. Without you, he will not go, and if he remains here, she waved her hand toward the lights of Almayer's folly, and the unfinished sentence died out in a threatening murmur. The two women had met behind the house, and now were walking slowly together towards the creek, where all the canoes were moored. Arrived at the fringe of bushes, they stopped by a common impulse, and Mrs. Almayer, laying her hand on her daughter's arm, tried in vain to look close into the girl's averted face. When she attempted to speak, her first words were lost in a stifled sob that sounded strangely coming from that woman, of all human passions, seemed to know only those of anger and hate. "'You're going away to be a great Renée," she said at last in a voice that was steady enough now, "'and if you be wise, you shall have much power that will endure many days and even last into your old age. What have I been? A slave all my life, and I have cooked rice for a man who had no courage and no wisdom. Heh! I, even I, was given in gift by a chief and a warrior to a man that was neither. Hi! Hi! She wailed to herself softly, lamenting the lost possibilities of murder and mischief that could have fallen to her lot had she been mated with a congenial spirit. Nina bent down over Mrs. Almayer's slight form and scanned attentively under the stars that had rushed out on the black sky and now hung breathless over the strange parting. Her mother's shriveled features and looked close into the sunken eyes that could see into her own dark future by the light of a long and a painful experience. Again she felt herself fascinated as of old by her mother's exalted mood and by the oracular certainty of expression which, together with her fits of violence, had contributed not a little to the reputation for witchcraft she enjoyed in the settlement. I was a slave, and you shall be a queen, went on Mrs. Almayer, looking straight before her. But remember, men's strength and their weakness. Tremble before his anger so that he may see your fear in the light of day. But in your heart you may laugh, for after sunset he is your slave. A slave, he, the master of life? You do not know him, mother. Mrs. Almayer condescended to laugh contemptuously. You speak like a fool of a white woman, she exclaimed. 
What do you know of men's anger and of men's love? Have you watched the sleep of men weary of dealing death? Have you felt about you the strong arm that could drive a Chris deep into a beating heart? Yeah, you are a white woman and ought to pray to a woman god. Why do you say this? I have listened to your words so long that I have forgotten my old life. If I was white, would I stand here ready to go? Mother, I shall return to the house and look once more at my father's face. No, said Mrs. Almayer violently. No, he sleeps now the sleep of gin, and if you went back, he might awake and see you. No, he shall never see you. When the terrible old man took you away from me when you were little, you remember? It was such a long time ago, murmured Nina. I remember, went on Mrs. Almayer fiercely. I wanted to look at your face again. He said no. I heard you cry and jumped into the river. You were his daughter then. You are my daughter now. Never shall you go back to that house. You shall never cross this courtyard again. No, no. Her voice rose almost to a shout. On the other side of the creek there was a rustle in the long grass. The two women heard it and listened for a while in startled silence. I shall go, said Nina in a cautious but intense whisper. What is your hate or your revenge to me? She moved towards the house, Mrs. Almayer clinging to her and trying to pull her back. Stop, you shall not go, she gasped. Nina pushed away her mother impatiently and gathered up her skirts for a quick run, but Mrs. Almayer ran forward and turned round, facing her daughter with outstretched arms. If you move another step, she exclaimed, breathing quickly, I shall cry out. Do you see those lights in the big house? There sit two white men, angry because they cannot have the blood of the man you love. And in those dark houses, she continued more calmly as she pointed toward the settlement, my voice could wake up men that would lead the Orang Blanda soldiers to him who is waiting for you. She could not see her daughter's face, but the white figure before her stood silent and irresolute in the darkness. Mrs. Almayer pursued her advantage. Give up your old life. Forget, she said in entreating tones. Forget that you ever looked at a white face. Forget their words. Forget their thoughts. They speak lies, and they think lies because they despise us that are better than they are, but not so strong. Forget their friendship and their contempt. Forget their many gods. Girl, why do you want to remember the past when there is a warrior and a chief ready to give many lives his own life for one of your smiles. While she spoke, she pushed gently her daughter towards the canoes, hiding her own fear, anxiety, and doubt under the flood of passionate words that left Nina no time to think and no opportunity to protest, even if she had wished it. But she did not wish it now. At the bottom of that passing desire to look again at her father's face, there was no strong affection. She felt no scruples and no remorse at leaving suddenly that man whose sentiment towards herself she could not understand. She could not even see. There was only an instinctive clinging to old life, to old habits, to old faces, that fear of finality which lurks in every human breast and prevents so many heroisms and so many crimes. For years she had stood between her mother and her father, the one so strong in her weakness, the other so weak where he could have been strong. Between those two beings, so dissimilar, so antagonistic, she stood with mute heart, wondering and angry at the fact of her own existence. It seemed so unreasonable, so humiliating, to be flung there in that settlement and to see the days rush by into the past without a hope, a desire, or an aim that would justify the life she had to endure in ever-growing weariness. She had little belief and no sympathy for her father's dreams, but the savage ravings of her mother chanced to strike a responsive chord deep down somewhere in her despairing heart, and she dreamed dreams of her own with the persistent absorption of a captive thinking of liberty within the walls of his prison cell. With the coming of Dane, she found the road to freedom by obeying the voice of the newborn impulses, and with 
surprised joy she thought that she could read in his eyes the answer to all the questions of her heart. She understood now the reason and the aim of life, and in the triumphant unveiling of that mystery she threw away, disdainfully, her past with its sad thoughts, its bitter feelings, and its faint affections, now withered and dead in contact with her fierce passion. Mrs. Elmayer unmoored Nina's own canoe, and straightening herself painfully, stood, painter in hand, looking at her daughter. Quick, she said, get away before the moon rises, while the river is dark. I am afraid of Abdullah's slaves. The wretches prowl in the night often, and might see you and follow you. There are two paddles in the canoe. Nina approached her mother and hesitatingly touched lightly with her lips the wrinkled forehead. Mrs. Almeyer snorted contemptuously in protest against that tenderness which she, nevertheless, feared could be contagious. "'Shall I see you again, mother?' murmured Nina. "'No,' said Mrs. Almeyer, after a short silence. "'Why should you return here, where it is my fate to die? "'You will live far away in splendor and might. "'When I hear of white men driven from the islands, "'then I shall know that you are alive and that you remember my words.' I shall always remember, returned Nina earnestly, but where is my power and what can I do? Do not let him look too long in your eyes, nor lay his head on your knees without reminding him that men should fight before they rest, and if he lingers, give him his crisps, yourself, and bidding go, as the wife of a mighty prince should do when the enemies are near. Let him slay the white men that come to us to trade, with prayers on their lips, and loaded guns in their hands. Ay, she ended with a sigh, they are on every sea and on every shore, and they are very many. She swung the bow of the canoe towards the river, but did not let go of the gunwale, keeping her hand out in irresolute thoughtfulness. Nina put the point of the paddle against the bank, ready to shove off into the stream. What is it, mother? she asked in a low voice. Do you hear anything? No, said Mrs. Almayer absently. Listen, Nina, she continued abruptly, after a slight pause. In after years, there will be other women. A stifled cry in the boat interrupted her, and the paddle rattled in the canoe as it slipped from Nina's hands, which she put out in a protesting gesture. Mrs. Almayer fell on her knees on the bank and leaned over the gunwale so as to bring her own face close to her daughter's. There will be other women, she repeated firmly. I tell you that, because you are half white, and you may forget that he is a great chief, and that such things must be. Hide your anger, and do not let him see on your face the pain that will eat your heart. Meet him with joy in your eyes and wisdom on your lips, for to you he will turn in sadness or in doubt. As long as he looks upon many women, your power will last. But should there be one, one only with whom he seems to forget you, then I could not live, exclaimed Nina, covering her face with both her hands. Do not speak so, mother, it could not be. Then went on Mrs. Almayer steadily, to that woman Nina show no mercy. She moved the canoe down towards the stream by the gunwale and gripped it with both her hands, the bow pointing into the river. Are you crying, she asked sternly of her daughter, who sat still with her covered face. Arise and take your paddle, for he has waited long enough. And remember, Nina, no mercy, and if you must strike, strike with a steady hand. She put out all her strength, and swinging her body over the water, shot the little light craft far into the stream. When she recovered herself from the effort, she tried vainly to catch a glimpse of the canoe that seemed to have dissolved suddenly into the white mist trailing over the heated waters of the Pante. After listening for a while intently on her knees, Mrs. Almayer rose with a deep sigh, while two tears wandered slowly down her withered cheeks. She wiped them off quickly with a wisp of her gray hair, as if ashamed of herself, but could not stifle another loud sigh for her heart was heavy and she suffered much, being unused to tender emotions. This time she fancied she had heard a faint noise, like the echo of her own sigh, and she stopped, 
straining her ears to catch the slightest sound and peering apprehensively towards the bushes near her. Who is there? she asked in an unsteady voice, while her imagination peopled the solitude of the river with ghost-like forms. Who is there? she repeated faintly. There was no answer, only the voice of the river murmuring in sad monotone behind the white veil seemed to swell louder for a moment, to die away again in a soft whisper of eddies washing against the bank. Mrs. Elmayer shook her head as if in answer to her own thoughts and walked quickly away from the bushes, looking to the right and left, watchfully. She went straight towards the cooking shed, observing that the embers of the fire there glowed more brightly than usual, as if somebody had been adding fresh fuel to the fires during the evening. As she approached, Babalachi, who had been squatting in the warm glow, rose and met her in the shadow outside. "'Is she gone?' asked the anxious statesman hastily. "'Yes,' answered Mrs. Elmayer. "'What are the white men doing? "'When did you leave them?' "'They are sleeping now, I think. "'May they never wake!' exclaimed Babalachi fervently. "'Oh, but they are devils, "'and made much talk and trouble over that carcass. "'The chief threatened me twice with his hand "'and said he would have me tied up to a tree. "'Tie me up to a tree, me!' he repeated, striking his breast violently. Mrs. Almayer laughed tauntingly. And you salaamed and asked for mercy. Men with arms by their side acted otherwise when I was young. And where are they, the men of your youth? You, you mad woman, retorted Babalachi angrily. Killed by the Dutch, aha! Uh -huh. But I shall live to deceive them. A man knows when to fight and when to tell peaceful lies. You would know that if you were not a woman. But Mrs. Elmayer did not seem to hear him. With bent body and outstretched arm, she appeared to be listening to some noise behind the shed. There are strange sounds, she whispered with evident alarm. I have heard in the air the sounds of grief, as of a sigh and weeping. That was by the riverside, and now again I heard. Where? asked Babalachi, in an altered voice. What did you hear? Close here. It was like a breath, long drawn. I wish I had burnt the paper over the body before it was buried. Yes, assented Babalachi, but the white man had him thrown into a hole at once. You know, he found his death on that river, he added cheerfully, and his ghost may hail the canoes, but would leave the land alone. Mrs. Almayer, who had been craning her neck to look round the corner of the shed, drew back her head. There is nobody there, she said, reassured. Is it not time for the Rajah war canoe to go to the clearing? I have been waiting for it here, for I myself must go, explained Babalachi. I think I will go over and see what makes them late. When will you come? The Rajah gives you refuge. I shall paddle over before the break of day. I cannot leave my dollars behind, muttered Mrs. Almayer. They separated. Babalachi crossed the courtyard towards the creek to get his canoe and Mrs. Almayer walked slowly to the house, ascended the plankway, and passing through the back veranda, entered the passage leading to the front of the house. But before going in, she turned in the doorway and looked back at the empty and silent courtyard, now lit up by the rays of the rising moon. No sooner she had disappeared, however, than a vague shape flitted out from amongst the stalks of the banana plantation darted over the moonlit space and fell in the darkness at the foot of the veranda. It might have been the shadow of a driving cloud, so noiseless and rapid was its passage, but for the trail of disturbed grass, whose feathery heads trembled and swayed for a long time in the moonlight before they rested motionless and gleaming, like a design of silver sprays embroidered on a somber background. Mrs. Almayer lighted the coconut lamp, and lifting cautiously the red curtain, gazed upon her husband, shading the light with her hand. Almayer huddled up in the chair, one of his arms hanging down, the other thrown across the lower part of his face, as if to ward off an invisible enemy, his legs stretched straight out, slept heavily, unconscious of the unfriendly eyes that looked upon him in disparaging criticism. 
At his feet lay the overturned table amongst a wreck of crockery and broken bottles. The appearance as of traces left by a desperate struggle was accentuated by the chairs, which seemed to have been scattered violently all over the place, and now lay about the veranda with a lamentable aspect of inebriety in their helpless attitudes. Only Nina's big rocking chair, standing black and motionless on its high runners, towered above the chaos of demoralized furniture, unflinchingly dignified and patient, waiting for its burden. With a last scornful look towards the sleeper, Mrs. Almayer passed behind the curtain into her own room. A couple of bats, encouraged by the darkness and the peaceful state of affairs, resumed their silent and oblique gambols above Almayer's head, and for a long time the profound quiet of the house was unbroken, save for the deep breathing of the sleeping man and the faint tinkle of silver in the hands of the woman preparing for flight. In the increasing light of the moon that had risen now above the night mist, the objects on the veranda came out strongly outlined in black splashes of shadow with all the uncompromising ugliness of their disorder, and a caricature of the sleeping Almayer appeared on the dirty whitewash of the wall behind him in a grotesquely exaggerated detail of attitude and feature enlarged to a heroic size. The discontented bats departed in quest of darker places, and a lizard came out in short, nervous rushes, and, pleased with the white tablecloth, stopped on it in breathless immobility that would have suggested sudden death had it not been for the melodious call he exchanged with a less adventurous friend hiding amongst the lumber in the courtyard. Then the boards and the passage creaked, the lizard vanished, and Almayer stirred uneasily with a sigh, slowly, out of the senseless annihilation of drunken sleep. He was returning through the land of dreams, to waking consciousness. Almayer's head rolled from shoulder to shoulder in the oppression of his dream, the heavens had descended upon him like a heavy mantle, and trailed in starred folds far under him, stars above, stars all around him, and from the stars under his feet rose a whisper full of entreaties and tears, and sorrowful faces flitted amongst the clusters of light, filling the infinite space below. How escape from the importunity of lamentable cries and from the look of staring, sad eyes in the faces which pressed round him till he gasped for breath under the crushing weight of worlds that hung over his aching shoulders. Get away, but how? If he attempted to move, he would step off into nothing and perish and the crashing fall of that universe of which he was the only support. And what were the voices saying, urging him to move? Why? Move to destruction? Not likely. The absurdity of the thing filled him with indignation. He got a firmer foothold and stiffened his muscles in heroic resolve to carry his burden to all eternity and ages passed in their superhuman labor amidst the rush of circling worlds and the plaintive murmur of sorrowful voices urging him to decease before it was too late till the mysterious power that had laid upon him the giant task seemed at last to seek his destruction. With terror he felt an irresistible hand shaking him by the shoulder while the chorus of voices swelled louder into an agonized prayer to go, go before it is too late. He felt himself slipping, losing his balance as something dragged at his legs, and he fell. With a faint cry, he glided out of the anguish of perishing creation into an imperfect waking that seemed to be still under the spell of his dream. What? 
what? he murmured sleepily, without moving or opening his eyes. His head still felt heavy, and he had not the courage to raise his eyelids. In his ears there still lingered the sound of entreating whisper. Am I awake? Why do I hear the voices? he argued to himself, hazily. I cannot get rid of the horrible nightmare yet. I have been very drunk. And what is that shaking me? I am dreaming yet. I must open my eyes and be done with it. I am only half awake, it is evident. He made an effort to shake off his stupor and saw a face close to his, glaring at him with staring eyeballs. He closed his eyes again in amazed horror and sat up straight in the chair, trembling in every limb. What was this apparition? His own fancy, no doubt. His nerves had been much tried the day before, and then the drink. He would not see it again if he had the courage to look. He would look directly, get a little steadier first. So, now, he looked. The figure of a woman standing in the steely light, her hands stretched forth in a suppliant gesture, confronted him from the far-off end of the veranda, and in the space between him and the obstinate phantom floated the murmur of words that fell on his ears in a jumble of torturing sentences, the meaning of which escaped the utmost efforts of his brain. Who spoke the melee words? Who ran away? Why too late? And too late for what? What meant those words of hate and love mixed so strangely together? The ever-recurring names falling on his ears again and again. Nina, Dane, Dane, Nina. Dane was dead and Nina was sleeping, unaware of the terrible experience through which he was now passing. Was he going to be tormented forever, sleeping or waking, and have no peace either night or day? What was the meaning of this? He shouted the last words aloud. The shadowy woman seemed to shrink and recede a little from him towards the doorway, and there was a shriek exasperated by the incomprehensible nature of his torment almayer made a rush upon the apparition which eluded his grasp and he brought up heavily against the wall quick as lightning he turned round and pursued fiercely the mysterious figure fleeing from him with piercing shrieks that were like fuel to the flames of his anger over the furniture round the overturned table and now he had it cornered behind Nina's chair. To the left, to the right, they dodged, the chair rocking madly between them. She sent it out shriek after shriek at every feint, and he, growling meaningless curses through his hard-set teeth. Oh, the fiendish noise that split his head and seemed to choke his breath. It would kill him. It must be stopped. An insane desire to crush that yelling thing induced him to cast himself recklessly over the chair with a desperate grab, and they came down together in a cloud of dust amongst the splintered wood. The last shriek died out under him in a faint gurgle, and he had secured the relief of absolute silence. He looked at the woman's face under him, a real woman. He knew her. By all that is wonderful, Tamina, he jumped up, ashamed of his fury, and stood perplexed, wiping his forehead. The girl struggled to a kneeling posture and embraced his legs in a frenzy of prayer for mercy. Don't be afraid, he said, raising her. I shall not hurt you. Why do you come to my house in the night? And if you had to come, why not go behind the curtain where the women sleep? The place behind the curtain is empty, gasped Tamina, catching her breath between the words. There are no women in your house any more, Tuan. I saw the old men go away before I tried to wake you. I did not want your women. I wanted you. Old men? repeated Almayer. Do you mean my wife? She nodded her head. But of my daughter you are not afraid, said Almayer. Have you not heard me? she exclaimed. Have I not spoken for a long time when you lay there with eyes half open? She is gone too. 
I was asleep. I cannot tell when a man is asleep and when awake. Sometimes, answered Tamina in a low voice, sometimes the spirit lingers close to a sleeping body and may hear. I spoke a long time before I touched you, and I spoke softly for fear it would depart at a sudden noise and leave you sleeping forever. I took you by the shoulder only when you began to mutter words I could not understand. Have you not heard then, and do you know nothing? Nothing of what you said. What is it? Tell again if you want me to know. He took her by the shoulder and led her, unresisting, to the front of the veranda into a stronger light. She wrung her hands with such an appearance of grief that he began to be alarmed. Speak, he said. You made noise enough to wake even dead men, and yet nobody living came, he added to himself in an uneasy whisper. Are you mute? Speak, he repeated. In a rush of words which broke out after a short struggle from her trembling lips, she told him the tale of Nina's love and her own jealousy. Several times he looked angrily into her face and told her to be silent, but he could not stop the sounds that seemed to him to run out in a hot stream, swirling about his feet and rising in scalding waves about him, higher and higher, drowning his heart, touching his lips with a feel of molten lead, blotting out his sight and scorching vapor, closing over his head, merciless and deadly. When she spoke of the deception as to Dane's death, of which he had been the victim only that day, he glanced again at her with terrible eyes and made her falter for a second, but he turned away directly, and his face suddenly lost all expression in a stony stare far away over the river. Ah, the river, his old friend from his old enemy, speaking always with the same voice as he runs from year to year, bringing fortune or disappointment, happiness or pain, upon the same varying but unchanged surface of glancing currents and swirling eddies. For many years he had listened to the passionless and soothing murmur that sometimes was the song of hope, at times the song of triumph, of encouragement, more often the whisper of consolation that spoke of better days to come. For so many years, so many years, and now to the accompaniment of that murmur he listened to the slow and painful beating of his heart. He listened attentively, wondering at the regularity of its beats. He began to count mechanically. One, two, why count? At the next beat it must stop. No heart could suffer so and beat so steadily for long. Those regular strokes as of a muffled hammer that rang in his ears must stop soon still beating, unceasing, and cruel. No man can hear this, and is this the last, or will the next one be the last? How much longer? Oh, God, how much longer? His hand weighed heavier unconsciously on the girl's shoulder, and she spoke the last words of her story, crouching at his feet with tears of pain and shame and anger, was her revenge to fail her. This white man was like a senseless stone. Too late, too late. And you saw her go, Almeyer's voice sounded harshly above her head. Did I not tell you, she sobbed, trying to wriggle gently out from under his grip. Did I not tell you that I saw the witch woman push the canoe? I lay hidden in the grass and heard all the words. She that we used to call the white mem wanted to return to look at your face, but the witch woman forbade her, and she sank lower yet on her elbow, turning half round under the downward push of the heavy hand, her face lifted up to him with spiteful eyes. And she obeyed, she shouted out in a half laugh, half cry of pain. Let me go, Tuan. Why are you angry with me? Hasten, or you shall be too late to show your anger 
to the deceitful woman. Al Mayer dragged her up to her feet and looked close into her face while she struggled, turning her head away from his wild stare. Who sent you here to torment me? he asked violently. I do not believe you. You lie. He straightened his arm suddenly and flung her across the veranda towards the doorway where she lay immobile and silent as if she had left her life in his grasp, a dark heap without a sound or a stir. Oh, Nina, whispered Almeyer, and a voice in which reproach and love spoke together in pained tenderness. Oh, Nina, I do not believe. A light draft from the river ran over the courtyard in a wave of, of bowing grass, and entering the veranda touched Almeyer's forehead with its cool breath in a caress of infinite pity. The curtain in the women's doorway blew out and instantly collapsed with startling helplessness. He stared at the fluttering stuff. Nina cried Almeyer, where are you, Nina? The wind passed out of the empty house in a tremulous sigh, and all was still. Almeyer hid his face in his hands, as if to shut out a loathsome sight. When hearing a slight rustle, he uncovered his eyes. The dark heap by the door was gone.